Let me see if we are live. We are. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to Plugged Into History. This is Let's Talk Tuesday, and I'm really excited to share Let's Talk Tuesday today uh, with a wonderful guest. This is Leslie Simmons from Turning Leaf Project. Um, thanks so much for being here, Leslie. Uh, we are going to talk today about Turning Leaf Project. This is a really important initiative here in Charleston, and um, Leslie is here to give us all the information on what Turning Leaf Project is, how successful they've been, and what um, they're going to do in future. And we're going to talk a little bit about a partnership that has uh, developed, yay, between Middleton Place Foundation and Turning Leaf Project. So if you all have any questions, of course, like always, during the broadcast, if you have questions, please make sure that you drop them in the comments section and we are happy to answer them. I will be sure to feed those questions to Leslie. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for helping us to share history and to work towards positive change. So Leslie, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about Turning Leaf? Absolutely, Karen, thank you so much for having me. Um, Turning Leaf is really excited about this partnership as well. Um, so I'll just let you know a little bit about what we do here. Um, so Turning Leaf is a nonprofit. We are in North Charleston and um, as a whole, we help to keep men out of prison. Um, so basically how we do that though is through a four month long program. The men come to us um, in many different ways. A lot of times it's just through networking. Um, they meet someone who is also in the halfway house with them, who's been in our program, or they have a friend or, you know, one of their old cellmates or something like that. And um, they found, you know, Turning Leaf and they found that it's been really helpful to break their cycle of incarceration. So the gentlemen who come to us usually have been in prison more than once, some as many as five times. We have a student right now who actually has spent more than half of his life in prison. He's 35, oh. spent about 19 years in prison throughout that time. So um, Turning Leaf is to really help the men to think differently so that they are able to behave differently. Um, typically what happens is, you know, in prison, they're like, oh my gosh, I really don't wanna keep doing this. I really need to clean it up. I need to stop this criminal lifestyle. But then when they get back to, you know, the real world, um, they struggle with the fact that it is hard to get a job if you have a criminal background. It's hard to find housing. Um, it's a lot easier to just go back to a criminal lifestyle and make money in, you know, in a legal way and be able to buy whatever you want than it is to actually convince people that you are a good solid person and will be a good employee to them. So that's where Turning Leaf comes in. Um, the guys spend half of their day with us um, every day in a group therapy session. So it's cognitive behavioral therapy. And um, over the course of the four months, they'll do 150 hours of cognitive behavioral therapy, um, basically teaching them skills. We have um, a number of skills that we go through throughout that process and some are, as easy as asking for help, you know, just instead of turning straight to like selling drugs or doing something like that, you know, asking your parent or your friend, Hey, I'm in a bad spot right now. My bills are due. I need to pay them. I don't have the money right now, but I'll get paid on Friday. Could you help me out till Friday? Some of the guys just don't have, you know, the background of doing that. They've been really independent and they've never needed to. Um, so a skill like that is extremely helpful. Um, active listening is another skill, you know, just different, different things that we in everyday life use, but some people didn't have the benefit of having that taught to them. And um, so it really, it really helps the guys, especially when they're like frustrated, you know, just using a social skill, like, um, stop and think is what most of our guys use more than anything is just, oh, all right, let's stop. Let's think about this. And then we can see, okay, one path might be choosing the criminal lifestyle. One path might be doing something else, but one path could be doing, you know, this right thing that's for right for me and my family right now. All right. What are the benefits of those? What are the negative consequences of those? Okay. From all of that analysis, I can make the conscious decision to go with the right path because I know that it has the most beneficial 
consequences, you know, from my options here. So, um, and then the other part of our program is um, we do job training as well. And we do that through our op fully operational screen print, sorry, screen printing shop. Um, and so we do both retail and wholesale screen printing, um, mostly t-shirts, but we can print pretty much anything. And that's the biggest way to support the program. Um, the guys are learning skills that some of them have never used before. Um, a lot of the guys come to us and have never had a job. And so things as simple as being on time, being off your phone, um, you know, just clocking in. A lot of the guys don't know how to clock in when they first start. So things that they'll need to have the skills for to go forward and get a job, um, they'll, they'll get that in our screen printing shop. And so they hand print every single shirt that's ordered and um, and with our retail stuff, it comes with their story. So you can get um, a little bit more connected with what they do. And um, and then on top of that, there's some different incentives throughout the program. Um, we use different levels, you know, throughout that that are basically an incentive to keep going because a four time or four months is a long time to ask people to do anything. You know, I have a hard time doing anything for four months. So. Yeah. <laughs> who has never done anything before and then be like, yeah, but at the end of this, we'll get you a job. It's like, that, but that's, you know, that's completely out of reach for some people. So we do use little incentives along the way, like um, levels. One, when you show up on time, you have your homework, um, you stay awake throughout class, you stay off your phone, um, all of those things account to a point. And then the points will allow you to level up, which also increases your pay. So little things like that are really helpful in our program. Um, we do yeah. some other things. Like Go ahead. Just a really quick question, because I think that's an important point. Um, the guys are not only invited to come and do this program, but they're paid to be there. So it starts as a job, come to class and then learn job skills, right? So um, this is a really important aspect of, of the program by, by showing up, by being there, by committing. Um, there's there's already, you know, along with these other um, sort of immediate incentives, you know, this is exactly what you said. It's a great skill to learn, to, to be there, to be in a routine of something like that. So absolutely. Well, and just very cool. the jobs that they'll continue on with, um, you know, if you don't show up, you don't get paid. Right like that like oh okay you know I have to be there I have to be on time I have to be accountable um in our print shop we're really strict about phone usage because we've noticed a lot of our job partners have had issues with that with you know their current employees so if you're caught on your phone once you get a warning if you're caught again you get sent home and you don't get paid for the rest of the day you know the accountability piece of the program is really what encourages that change um because if they're not held accountable then um a lot of times you know it's hard to have them keep coming to have them actually experience the entire 150 hours of the CBT that we require, that sort of thing. Um, especially because we have some local job partners um, and basically the job partners will interview our guys just like a normal job interview and everything, but be aware of the fact that they do have this criminal background. However, they're really working very hard to, um, you know, make right for what they've done. They've, you know, done enough time in prison and they're coming out with this like commitment to us that they're going to go through the whole program. They'll show up on time. They'll learn all the skills they need and they're committed to getting a long-term job. So all of our partners are, um, you know, really great jobs. We have um, quite a few partners who do like a 90 day grace period. And then there's a raise after that 90 days. Um, we have all of our partners are, um, have paid time off, have, you know, full time, full benefits. It's a full time employment, um, great schedule, stuff like that, that will encourage the guys that this is a career advancement opportunity. It's not just, okay, yeah, we can get you a job here that's temporary until you, you know, and help you build your resume. But there's opportunity for advancement within the jobs that we place them in as well. So oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, so a little bit about turning leaf because it wasn't always, um, or I guess from what I've read, um, that the model, you know, has evolved over time and has become more successful over time. And so you have a pretty, 
um, extraordinary graduation rate and an extraordinary rate of, um, you know, guys not being rearrested, right? As compared with the national averages. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So you're totally right. Um, when Amy, who is our um, executive director and founder, she started the program about 10 years ago. And when she was first doing it, she was just volunteering in jails and they asked her to keep coming. And they were like, hey, could you maybe do a class? I think what you're doing is really valuable for the guys. And I think that that would be um, really helpful. And so she started doing an in-prison class, but she was working full time um, at the same time. And then she kind of um, evolved the program into more of like a, like a work release sort of program. And so the guys would get released from prison, come to the class, go back to prison. And then it evolved again where it was a court mandated. So the guys would get out and per the judge, he would say, okay, yeah, you'll get out early um, and you have to be on probation for this amount of time. You have to do this for this amount of time and you have to attend a class at turning leaf. And so we had guys coming in that way. Um, but now we're actually completely volunteer or um, like voluntary enrollment. So the guys find out about us through different avenues. Um, we do a lot of outreach into the prisons and then um, outreach in the community. And then they come to us because they want to. That was one of the biggest things originally that, you know, if you force anyone to do anything and that they don't want to do, it's not going to work. Right. Sure. Um, so over all of these of evolving, um, we found really like our target population, the guys that are going to su succeed best with us. Um, and so we have like a whole process on app applying to the program. Um, you have to do like a phone interview and then um, come in and we'll just see what risk level you're at and stuff like that. And from that, we've had, um, like you said, a really great turnout. Um, last year, we actually had 50 men come through our program um, and the graduation rate was uh, you know, amazing um, with 50 men coming through this program. It's a four month program. So we just do instead of like starting on X date or whatever, if somebody comes in on Thursday, they're starting on Friday. You know, it's so it's basically teach in a cycle and it's just continuous enrollment. And we've found that that's been extremely helpful in our um, in graduating 50 men last year. Um, and then the other thing is the um, nationally recidivism, which is when um, somebody is actually released from prison and then goes back into prison or is rearrested. Um, that is pretty high. I, I actually don't know the exact numbers, but I think it's around like 80%. Um, yeah, it's definitely over 60. I think I read yeah, it's definitely over 60%. Yeah. So, um, and with our graduates, it's closer to 20%. So, um, that's really amazing. You know, we, of course, of people who have been rearrested, but they didn't go back to prison. And that's really what's important to us, you know, because it could have been something like, you know, they are caught up in something else or whatever, but, you know, they've changed enough that they're not doing those major crimes. They're not involved with the same crowds and doing the same criminal activity that they were before. And everybody messes up. And, you know, we have that but 20 percent is way more than we could fast for it's yeah that's way that's less than one in four i mean you know that's an incredible rate compared to a national average that is so very high and yeah. um turning leaf focuses on um violent criminal offenders right i mean that's the, mm -hmm. the target population yeah, we basically have three um three like types or categories of people that we help um, and one is like violent offenders. One is somebody who's caught up in the lifestyle. So, um, you know, when you're like selling drugs, for example, you're making a lot of money. Like it's, it's shocking, um, how much these guys have made in their criminal lives. And in that you get caught up in like, you can pay for everything. You can buy whatever you want. You can have whatever you want. Kind of that lifestyle kind of keeps pulling you back in. Um, mm -hmm. And the other aspect is um, more just like the, mo the money, the like financial aspect. So um, it just kind of depends. And we have a lot of guys in all three categories. Sure. And so I think this brings me to how um, Middleton Place is looking to partner with Turning Leaf. Um, you were mentioning the print shop. 
there at Turning Leaf. And Turning Leaf Project is a nonprofit organization, and it has this retail component, which is incredible, this print shop that you were talking about. And you already provide t-shirts for a bunch of entities around town, right? Um, yeah, totally. the Charleston totally. County Parks and some other, um, some yeah, other entities. Yeah. A lot of like restaurants we do, um, like Taco Boy, Kaminsky's, um, the, uh, like Children's Museum, we're doing an order for them right now, the Charleston Libraries, the P Parks and Recs. So yeah, quite a few places around town. Awesome. Shout out to all those partners. That's cool. We like that. So we want to be included in that list. So we're really excited. Um, Middleton Place, I, I approached Leslie and said we'd really like to have some t-shirts um, printed by the guys in the Turning Leaf shop. And um, you asked for some artwork. And I said that I perhaps had a different idea if we could maybe make it work. And so I was really interested in not just providing artwork to be screen printed. Um, we have plenty of beautiful iconography around here, beautiful imagery that we could easily screen print on a t-shirt. But um, I was really interested in seeing if the class at Turning Leaf would have any interest in coming out here, experiencing Middleton Place, and then translating their own experience into a design that they create for us that we can then sell. Um, so we definitely want to support the mission of Turning Leaf um, and also create this way to show how um, lots of different folks experience our mission because we had a lot of guys come out here. Um, some of them have been here before, a number of times actually. They're all from town and so they've been here uh, as kids and on field trips and stuff, but there were a lot of guys who had never been here before. Um, and so we wanted the chance to um, let them see and experience. And unfortunately the rain got us and we didn't get to see everything. So um, I'm hoping that y'all will be able to come back out and join us again. But um, they were, um, I think they were excited to come out to learn a little bit about Middleton Place and experience it. And then um, there were a few that in particular were really into creating this design and, and, and um, sharing their impressions of Middleton Place. Can you talk a little bit about what you heard from the class? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like you said, everyone was actually really excited about um, the field trip because it's something that we don't typically do around here. And to be involved in something like that was really exciting for all of the guys. So um, we were really as a, you know, just something for us to do. And um, I actually talked with the guys yesterday about kind of what I'm sorry, I keep getting these notifications. Um, and about what kind of design that they were looking at. And overwhelmingly, the guys, which I'm not surprised at, thought that it was just gorgeous. They were like, honestly, I have never seen any place like that. Like we're used to being in the neighborhoods, in the streets. And this was a retreat for us, somewhere to go, yeah. you know, away, just barely out of town, but, you know, somewhere to go and, like just have some like beautiful scenery and have some serenity for just a few moments out of our day. Um, everyone was really, really impressed by like the, the house um, there that we toured and all of the like things inside. Um, a lot of the guys were like, yeah, you know, I think it's incredible like to just to see the old dishware and to see like that sort of stuff that a lot of the guys had never seen before. Um, but overall, everybody just wanted to make sure that it was known what the history was, you know, that it wasn't just, you know, this like rich white family who made a lot of money and had a lot of land and, um, and all of that, but that there's a lot more to the story. Um, and I think yeah. when you were there, you had told us that there were about 3000 people who were enslaved at Middleton Place at one point in time. To the Middleton family. They weren't all here on this property, but yeah, to the Middleton family, over 3,000 individuals enslaved. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they were just, you know, shocked by that and thought that it was really important to make a graphic that makes a connection between what we see today, that is this like gorgeous retreat just right outside of town, 
to what it was then um, and kind of how, how it got here. So it was really interesting to talk to everyone because they were just like, everyone was just blown away by Middleton Place. Absolutely. Oh, I'm so glad. I, I appreciate that. And actually, I asked them if I could uh, turn the camera on and ask them about their impressions in person. So if you don't mind, um, for the next uh, like five minutes, I'd, I'd love to share um, and y'all will hear my voice off camera going, hey, everybody, like, thanks for being here. Ah. Um, I was just so uh, grateful for everybody, everybody's enthusiasm. So um, I'm going to share my screen here and I'm going to see if I can show you all their impressions of Middleton Place. Uh-oh. Part of the problem with using my part of the problem with using my headphones is that I now have no sound. Please hold. I'm gonna disconnect my Bluetooth. So, so um, this is Turn and Leave Project, and. These gentlemen are here for the first time to Can Middleton we hear that? Place, right? No. Well, no, some of y'all have been here no. as kids. No. No. Yeah. My first time, my first time. Your first time. Your first time. First time. Yeah. Y'all's first time being here? Yeah. yeah. Since you were little? So can we talk a little bit about um, how y'all find the preservation of Middleton Place and um, how we sort of experience this place and what you think about what we've got going on here. So I'm just gonna pan around, but if someone wants to like, you wanna go first? Yeah. I mean, um, to me, what I've seen so far is, is very, very interesting. Uh, it's something that I probably wouldn't get to see in a book. Like, even if I was seeing a book, I would probably wouldn't even read a book on this, but like, Boz is coming and seeing it and interacting. I mean, that's it's it's just something that really strike my attention. Like I want to see more. I want to see all of it. You want to see all of it? Thank yeah. you. So, I mean, it's I, what y'all got going on here is, is something. I think to me personally, it's something great. Like I think this it should be something y'all preserve and keep and keep going with it. I mean, I don't think it should be uh this race from you know, but this is a part of history. I mean, history is a big thing is you know, to a lot of people. So I, I think it's very cool that you guys have this one. Thank you. I appreciate that. Anybody else have any impressions of Middleton Place that they'd like to? I just think it was a good, I think it was a good uh, experience. I saw it. Good experience? Yeah, get to see stuff that I ain't ever seen before I've been introduced to. So I think it was good. And I y'all are some good workers. Thank you. Thanks. What other impressions do you want to share? Yeah. Oh, no, it's my first time in Middleton Place, man. And it's real historic, man. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Man. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Yeah, I, kinda, I really am. Yeah. I really enjoy, I'm really enjoying the experience. It kind of, it makes you want to go back in time, makes you want to step back and kind of get a feel of like what it was like back then. So when you look at things, I'm looking at it from a perspective of their point. Sure. Uh, it's a really good experience. I like the landscape, everything. I know that's really good. Um, the animals and all that stuff, it just makes you, it's like if you go back in time, it takes you away from the world a little bit. You can relax. I kind of like it. Uh, it's a good experience. You said you really love American history, huh? Yes, I do. And this yeah. is a really good experience. I like the feel of it. Like I said, it makes you feel like you, I can see actually driving like the car or the carriage thing. I can see it. It's pretty good. It's a pretty good experience. Thank you. Thanks very much. I just want to see uh, you know, This is my first time really uh, experiencing something like this. We're a historic uh, type of event that I'm experiencing. So I appreciate you um, showing us through some things that I probably thought I would never see. I, not to see, uh, not see for the first time. No? Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thanks for being here. Who that? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Charleston, so as a native. Uh, someone who prides himself on being a Geechee. Like when I was going to school and we came out here, you get a different 
view as a child. Like we were just trying to escape the classroom, coming out of here on, on, on tours and, and field trips, trying to understand what it was to come from a city where plantations were the foundation of our history. But being an adult coming out, especially in this time, I have a, I get a lot of new hunger, but a new desire to learn more because just knowing about who we are versus where a lot of these plantations come from and, and, and what they're doing now for the economy and what they're doing for us as a people is something that we really need to pay attention to because we need to educate our children. I'm a grandfather now, so I want to push those type of ideas and agendas to them so they can understand where we come from, what we need to do as a people, and just what we need to educate ourselves. Yeah. But I, I enjoyed the experience. I want to get them to come out here and, and, and let them learn more versus me just selling it to them. Yeah, so thank you. that'd be great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. yeah I'm going to get them to South Carolina as well. Knowing the importance and the historical aspects of our history. I used to come out here when I was a kid on field trips too, but I didn't understand the gravity and the importance of you know, our ancestors and what they did and how they lived their life on this plantation. But now that I understand it as a grown man, I want to be able to take things back and keep the legacy going, you know, because you know, I love my ancestors and I want to be able to play a part and keep that strong legacy intact. Sure. Thank you. Thanks so much. So I'm going to stop share there. So that's just a, a little piece. Um, we actually had a much longer conversation than that. And um, I didn't turn the camera back on after that because I just really appreciated what the guys were saying and, and what they were sharing with me, with us, with me. Um, and I didn't want to interrupt to be like, hold on, let me put this camera in your face. Um, but they just had such great input um, for me and for the foundation on how it is that we're doing what we're doing. Um, they gave us a lot of great information on, you know, what else we can do, what more we can do. I don't know if you remember, Leslie, but um, I think it was Mac was talking about asking for more um, Gullah Geechee interpreters, having basket sewers out and um, doing more, doing more, right? We, and that's something that we want to do. We, we know where we've come from, we know where we're going, and we want to do more. But hearing that there's an appetite for more out there in the community. Um, is really important to us. So um, I don't know, do you have anything else to add besides, I wanna queue up one more video here um, for everybody, but in the meantime, um, did no, I, no, I, I, I know I've forgotten things. You know, I think you said it. I think a lot of the guys were just so impressed and, you know, just in awe of the whole experience because a lot of times it was, you know, their first time there and they've never seen anything like this. And um, the feedback that they did give, you know, off camera too was the same, like, you know, that they, they wanted more, they wanted to do more, they wanted to be involved as well. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And something that we talked about at the very beginning of the visit, um, a lot of the guys asked us how much it costs to come out here. Mm -hmm. And it's not inexpensive. Um, and we know that it's not accessible to everybody. Um, and while we are working on different ways that we can work on that throughout the year, have community days, see if we can have, you know, pay what you can days, things like that. Um, we do want to make an effort to make Middleton Place accessible to partners like Turning Leaf. So um, we do want to make sure that we extend some passes that the guys can check out from you all there at Turning Leaf, and they can come and bring their families. You know, I was really moved that Mac and Jamar and um, a lot of the other guys said that they wanted to, and I think um, Will said he wanted to bring his grandmother, yeah. um, his mom out here. And so yeah. we wanna be able to make that happen. So um, I'm gonna make sure that we get you all some passes that you can sign out to them so that if the only barrier for them is the cost of admission, that shouldn't be a barrier. Um, so we're yeah. gonna make sure that we um, do what we can to make that accessible. but. Um, Jamar did uh, offer a poem uh, that he wrote, and he wrote it about Philip Simmons, who's a famous blacksmith here in Charleston. If y'all watching at home don't know who Philip Simmons was, he was a very important 
19th century um, and 20th century blacksmith here in the city of Charleston. His work is all over the city still and in the Charleston Museum um, and in other museums. I'm pretty sure he's got pieces in the Smithsonian, the National African American Museum in Washington, DC. So Philip Simmons is really um, a hometown hero here. And Jamar Wright is from the east side where Philip Simmons yeah, he is. He um, he and his family are from downtown Charleston on the east side and um, I mean, born and raised here. He has, I think, two sisters who are still in town and um, and he even like went down to one of the um, Philip, Sil Philip Simmons works and was taking pictures of it like pretty recently. Um, you know, he's just so moved by that, which is incredible to see. That's cool. And um, he offered that he has written a poem and so he offered to perform it for me. And so that was another moment that I did manage to get on camera. Um, so I'd like to share my screen one more time for everybody who's watching and hear Jamar's words. Downtown Charleston, off the east side. This poem is entitled "East Side," in honor of Philip Simmons, my home and land. Proud to be so blessed, very so blessed to be here. It goes like this: Journey with me, my drug and fist the neighborhood, nicknamed the Heat. The young brothers died tragically. Probably is so prevalent in my community. Gentrification can be huge. That's why folks are now moving in, buying our property abundantly. Tried and technical college besides in my hood, but only a few of us choose to attend. Look at me, a product of my environment. That's a few times failing out the state too. All the dope boys and thugs I know have all met the same fate. Some will be into society again. While I was to die in prison for life since. It is what it is. That's the street code mentality. But I refuse to be a failure. My purpose in life is much age. I inspire to achieve great feats like the renowned blacksmith from Lick Street. Full of songs made so rich in peace. Through all the drama, my neighborhood store store. And what's the Richard DeReef in the 1800s? An African American man bought numerous property on the east side of town. The mother Emmanuel for the nine parishes got massacred by dealing with the white supremacists and being ruled by two of us mingling around. I was once part of the problem. Now I choose to be part of the resolution, represent my community with pride by ESP, every day showing potential. I am the light that shines from the east side. I love that. He absolutely is the light that shines from the east side. And I'm so, so glad that he was willing to, to share his creativity with us. Um, yeah. And I'm so glad that all the guys in the class are willing to share their creativity with us. Um, just really appreciate y'all. I have been watching our comment section and I'm hoping that everybody is just thrilled and excited to take in this information. Nobody has questions. Now, I do want you all to know who are watching that I put in the description of this broadcast. If you wanna learn more about Turning Leaf, go to their website, turningleafproject.com. Um, really important, you can get lots of information there. Uh, you can contact Leslie and other staff members from the website. But um, so what's on tap for Turning Leaf in the coming days and weeks? What are you guys busy with? What are we going to see from the Turning Leaf project? Um, well, we are actually doing a social justice line right now um, for Black Lives Matter. Um, so we've been doing that retail line and we're releasing a new shirt today. So be on the lookout for that. It's a really- you are. I'm gonna yeah. have to make another purchase. <laughs> yeah, um, it's it's a really awesome shirt. Um, so be on the lookout for that one. Um, and then other than that, we are pretty busy in the retail shop. Um, we're doing some camp t-shirts for the Children's Museum and we have some um, ongoing orders for the Charleston County Park and Rec um, for their t-shirts. And I think we have just a couple of smaller orders. We're doing um, an order for a rally tomorrow uh, or no, on Thursday. Um, so yeah, just some, some people who wanted that. And we have one, um, we did the justice, um, it's, I think attorneys for justice rally last oh, week. Cool. Um, we did some shirts for them and we're going to do some more because people loved them. So yeah, we're pr pretty busy, pretty busy, which is good. It is good. Oh, good. And soon t-shirts for Middleton place as well. Designed exactly. by yes. students. Yeah. 
Well, that is so great. Thank you so, so much, Leslie. Thank you for your partnership. Thank you to the guys. Um, do you have some folks that are near graduation, um, near ending the program? Yeah, so actually on the um, the first person who spoke on that video, Brandon, he just started full time in the print shop. So he's probably about two weeks away. And um, there was another gentleman who spoke on there, um, Dwayne, and he's in the same boat. Um, so he's about two weeks away. Um, so yeah, and then we actually, um, one of the um, guys that wasn't able to be there that day, um, he had actually graduated on Friday. So we, we just um, had him too. So yeah. I love it. That's great. Um, and and we have two more guys moving out next week too, so. Okay. And we can read their stories on the turningleafproject.com as well, right? You highlight all of your students and tell their stories so that we can. Yes, we do. Yep. So every Wednesday on our social media, we post um, the link and the picture of the student that we're featuring um, for that week. And then it's also on our blog page. So if you just go to our website, um, one of the little tabs like on the top right will be blog and um, you can see all of them right there. That's great. And you said social media. So we need to follow on Facebook. We need to follow on Instagram. Yep. Yeah. We have a, a very new Twitter too. So um, cool. if you want to follow us on Twitter, we need those ones. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. right, we'll make sure that I go and do that as soon as I sign off with you. Awesome. Um, all right, folks. So that's about our time. Leslie, thank you so, so much. Um, everyone, thank you. Thank you for joining us here for Plugged Into History. This is an incredibly important Let's Talk Tuesday. The mission of Middleton Place is to, to connect people with the past um, and help us understand ourselves and each other better through the understanding of history and so that we can make a positive change in the future. And uh, we want to actively do that. And we're really grateful that Turning Leaf is there to help us out. So thank you. Thanks for helping us make a change. Thank and thank you for making and being the change. That's really excellent. And Look forward to hearing a lot more from uh, Turning Leaf in the future. So thanks a lot. All right, if you have any questions, if anything comes to you, go ahead and put it in the comments, everybody, and we'll make sure to forward your questions to Leslie and we'll get them answered for you. Um, otherwise, don't forget to join us on Thursday. Um, Thursday is the day before Juneteenth. It's the day before Emancipation Day. And actually here at Middleton Place, Emancipation Day was February 12th of 1865. That's when the Union troops came here. Um, we have a lot of history about that, but the National Day of Celebration is on June 19th, and we will have some special programming about that on Friday, and you can tune in here to our digital um, portal to watch it, but before that, we want to tell you a very special story about an enslaved person named Mac. He was enslaved to the Alston family who owned the Edmondson Alston house downtown, um, and that is another house museum that Middleton Place Foundation administers. And our president and CEO, Tracy Todd, is going to tell you the story of John Julius Pringle Alston, and most importantly, Mac. Um, they were at the siege of Battery Wagner at the very end of the war. So please come and join us on Thursday at noon to learn about Mac's story in service to the Confederate Army, not by choice. And um, keep helping us out by watching, by sharing. Make sure you go to turningleafproject.com and, and support our partners as well. So. Thanks so much, Leslie. Appreciate you being here. Absolutely. Thank you, Karen. Thanks for having me. Sure. All right, everybody. See you Thursday and Friday.